Thank you for taking the time to view this webinar as part of the series uh, by the STS called the 8 and 8 series. In this series, we're hoping to present a concise topic in eight, roughly eight minutes and eight or less slides. My name is Rakesh Arora. I'm a cardiac surgeon intensivist in Winnipeg, Manitoba at the University of Manitoba. My name is Rita Molesky. I'm a cardiac surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. In the next eight minutes, we're gonna highlight the key features you and your team need to know to both diagnose and treat delirium in the post-operative patient. First and foremost, it's important for to get this one point across, if nothing else. Delirium occurring in the post-operative patient is a medical emergency and, need to be, and needs to be treated as such. For the next several slides to this end, we'll talk about what delirium is, who is at risk, why it matters to your cardiac surgery patient, and what you and your team can do about it. Delirium is a common clinical syndrome characterized by an acute con confusional state, fluctuating mental status, inattention, and disorganized thinking and disturbed cognitive function. Delirium presents as a spectrum of clinical symptom subtypes that range on a continuum from hyperactive, which we are most used to, with the patient presenting as agitated, combative, and paranoid, to hypoactive, characterized by psychomotor slowness or sleepiness. A pearl to take away from this webinar is that a sleepy patient is an abnormal patient unless otherwise uh, delineated. There is also a mixed subtype, which includes a fluctuation between hyperactive and hypoactive. Of note, the acute confusion may precede a classic COVID symptoms, such as fever and cough. The assessment of delirium is essential to be able to diagnose and treat it promptly and efficiently. Delirium remains undiagnosed in 50% of patients where a systematic tool is not utilized. The assessment for the presence of delirium depends on where the patient is located in the hospital. The CAM-ICU or confusion assessment method and the intensive care delirium screening checklist can be utilized in the critical care setting. The CAM or the four ATs, alertness, abbreviated mental test, uh, attention and acute change or fluctuation in course can be utilized on the floor. Assessment for reversible causes uh, for delirium is a key priority. Pinch me is a mnemonic that can be utilized and is helpful for your team to develop a differential for why the patient is delirious. P, is the patient in pain? Is the patient infected? Is the patient constipated? Does hydration, hypoxia, hypotension, or hypoglycemia, uh, being, uh, is that a cause of the delirium? Has a medication recently been added or deleted for the patient? And is environment a cause, such as uh, sleep hygiene? So who gets delirium uh, in the hospital? Really, it's more common in the older adults, particularly those over the age of 65, but any age group can be vulnerable uh, to delirium with any acute illness or in the post-operative setting. When delirium occurs, unfortunately, it is associated with pretty bad outcomes, including mortality, increased prolonged ICU length of stay or hospital length of stay, and increased rates of non-home discharge, so discharge to an institution or some place requiring higher degree of, of care rather than what they may have started with at their baseline. In addition to these important changes, Delirium has also been associated with longer term effects that affect both cognition and mood disorders, and this has been associated with increased risk of dementia later in life. Specifically in the cardiac surgery patient, why this matters, as many of our patients are older, particularly again over the age of 65, they are often have higher rates of comorbidity, more medications, and have higher rates of frailty. And when one looks for frailty in our patients, about 50% of our patients do you have the features consistent with frailty? And if you're frail, you have about a five to eight fold increased risk of delirium after heart surgery. When you have delirium after heart surgery, in addition to the factors that I've described with regards to mortality and hospital and ICU length of stay, it's associated with worse functional survival. That term is so, what that term means specifically is those patients who do survive, but don't, aren't able to go back to their own home after surgery. There are multiple non-pharmacologic ways to prevent, minimize, and treat delirium. There are several tips and tricks for a multidisciplinary approach to delirium, which include increased screening in post-op cardiac surgery patients, and also utilization of ICU liberation bundles known as A, B, C, D, E, and F. A, assess the patient. B, utilize both the spontaneous awake and spontaneous breathing trials. 
C, choice of sedation to limit the delirium. In particular, benzodiazepines are generally not a first or second line drug of choice for sedation. However, in a context of a possible drug shortage in the current context of COVID-19, the use of a benzodiazepine agent may be needed to utilize at the lowest effective dose to target the, low, the effective sedation. D, delirium monitoring, E, early mobilization, and F, utilization of the family. One wants to DC any con contributory medications as well as orient the patient often. Harnessing the power of the family is extremely important. You want to invite the family members to the, uh, the in culture of the uh, patient rounds as well as patient care. Orient the family to the unit and to the unit's culture. Actively engage the family in rounds and patient orientation and patient care. Encourage uh, questions from the family and ask the questions of the family members to keep them engaged in, pa in patient care. And summarize the patient status uh, terminology that the family can actually understand. Summarize the big picture, convey the patient's progress, delineate the plan of care for the patient, delineate the patient's prognosis, and what is the patient's potential? Identify that. So here's some final thoughts on some non-pharmacologic ways to prevent, minimize, and treat delirium if it does occur in your patients. First, develop strategies to maintain sleep hygiene, which can be quite difficult in a post-operative environment, particularly in a busy or noisy intensive care unit. A patient's circadian rhythms often get disrupted in addition to the interruption of sleep that we cause by performing tests, evaluating the patients, and so forth can lead to loss of restorative sleep. Try to minimize tests where you can and take those opportunities to uh, orientate the patient frequently and minimize moving patients to unfamiliar environments wherever possible. Second, remove noxious stimuli that may contribute to irritation and therefore delirium in your patients. Such things as chest tubes, whenever they're able to come out as soon as possible, Foley catheters, and other lines and wires to minimize the risk of infection and promote mobility. Third, when a patient does become delirious, it's important not to antagonize them or patronize the patient. A patient that's delirious is really trying to do something that's purposeful in their mind that often might be at loggerheads with what the healthcare team may want to do that's reflective of their current cognitive state. As a general rule, calm begets calm in the majority of cases. Lastly, as we heard in the last slide, using antipsychotic medications can be used, but should use, be used sparingly and not as a first line agent, but to be used those primarily in patients who have significantly distressing symptoms or potentially present a harm to themselves or your healthcare team. Again, to summarize, delirium is a medical emergency and your team needs to be focused when this does occur to look for reasons for why it's occurring and treat it as rapidly as possible or treat the underlying cause as rapidly as possible to minimize both the short-term and long-term impact of delirium in our patients. Remember, there are multiple non-pharmacologic ways to prevent, minimize, and treat delirium. They're summarized for you on this slide, and as well as I point to these other important websites where you can get lots of information from your team in terms of downloadable posters or other information that may be helpful to get your team started down this road. With that, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Rita and myself for joining us in this webinar, and we hope we provide you more content like this in the future.